David Mespin. I am the director of the documentary Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water is a documentary that looks into the thousand year old history of surfing in Africa and works its way to the Americas. Um, and its first US premiere will begin in early February, February 11th in Santa Barbara. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am Bayan Abraha. I am the executive producer on Wade in the Water. Hey, it's Kellen. And today on Diversified Game, you guys are in for a real treat. We're going to ride the waves. And we have the director and the executive producer. That's the person sometimes who puts all the money behind the project <laughs> and, you know, uh, like I puppy, will. take that, take that, right? <laughs> uh, but they're going to give us the game on how surfing in with black folks. Yes, black folks have been surfing for over a thousand years and they're going to talk about Africa. They both were born in Addis. So, you know, salam to everybody in Addis <laughs> and tell, you know, the Habasha Beer Company to call me back. Uh, we want to do business. But, but man, brothers, welcome to the show. Let's get right into it because some people might think I have clickbait saying, Wait, surfing, Black people, Africa, what, what waves are in Africa? Like, folks will really think that. What waves, mm. again, <laughs> are mm. in Africa? Um, the You know, this whole thing started in Africa, and it started in Ethiopia. And, you guys, it's never been colonized. So, you know, give you guys game. I have to say that, because you guys know every Ethiopian, when they meet someone, there's one thing they're going to say. We've never been colonized. colonized. Yes, sir. Never, yeah. Haile Selassie, I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But, but who wants to start giving like the history and why this project is so important and, you know, how long it took to put together? Like, just, I'm, it's your guys' turn to just talk. I'm going to be quiet. For sure. sure, sure. Yeah, David, David, so, do you want to give some background? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think a, a bit of a context of, you know, who we are, my help, you know, uh, both of us were born in Ethiopia. We didn't know each other until this specific project. That said, we both came together because of our love of surfing. Um, mine began um, when I moved to the United States. So looking back in the 80s, I, I left Ethiopia during the communist regime and um migrated to the America. I was adopted, brought to a small town called St. Augustine, Florida, the East Coast, North, East Coast, South of Jacksonville. And there, you know, I lived with the family and um, they they lived right on the beach, literally. Like I walked out of my door and I looked out, it was the beach and I didn't know how to swim. And when I first arrived, I didn't even know how to speak English. So that summer was a crash course in swimming English and then connecting to the ocean. And that connection to the ocean continues to this day. Um, that connection to Mother Ocean was something that I needed as a person, you know, at a very young age, moving here, left my family behind. It, it gave me, I always say, it's like it's the escape, it's the refuge. And there was something about connecting to the ocean that really helped me, you know, overcome anything that I was dealing with. And surfing, you know, in particular, you know, Bayan can speak to this. There's something about surfing that that teaches you many things, you know, like you know, you don't catch your first wave, you paddle for the next one, you catch it, it teaches you patience, it teaches you to, you know, so many things about life that you're able to overcome just from that experience. So there's a lot to it than just, you know, the spiritual connection and 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 lessons you learn from it. So I continued to serve, um, eventually, you know, finished high school, college. I didn't finish college halfway. I ended up moving actually to California to finish my education at Cal State Long Beach for advertising and design. And when I moved here, you know, this idea of surfing and talking about in context of Black culture, you would see Black people here and there. Even in St. Augustine, Florida, there was one surfer, Sean, that I knew, but it was like one of many. In California, you would see a few more and, you know, the typical, you know, we would nod and say hello, acknowledge each other and so forth. You leave it at that. But it's in 2020, 2011 when a good friend of mine, Al Ashkabada, introduced me to 
a group of surfers called Black Surfers Collective. And this was like a collective group of people that had decided to establish what's called the Nick Gabaldon Day. Nick was the first documented Black surfer that was surfing in the 50s. So they were commemorating him and also they were using this opportunity to expand on the idea of teaching kids from all walks of life, the BIPOC community to come and learn and connect to Mother Ocean. And that was such an impactful moment for me because I've never seen such, you know, group of people, group of, you know, collective of Black folks surfing. It was just, you know, it's just mind blowing. It was such a beautiful sight. And I continue to do that, you know, teaching with them over the summers. And it was in 20, you know, during COVID and Black Lives Matter, that this, the inception of this idea of weight in the, in the water came as I was dealing with, you know, the issue of day, the death of George Floyd. I think as a creative person, I needed an outlet. And that outlet was to do something that actually had purpose and that gave back to something that I cared about. And the thing that I cared about that continued to support me all these years was this connection to Mother Ocean and Black Surfers Collective. And that turned into wanting to do just a portrait of them with these leaves around them, which you will see on our website, waitinthewaterproject.com. And the idea was to, you know, to say that as Africans, we, re we need to reconnect to our uh, roots. And the way we could do that is this juxtaposition of the leaf and these portraits I would take. But as I began that, I felt like, you know, I needed to do a bit more research about what it is to be a Black surfer. I knew about Nick, I knew about Black Surfers Collective, but I knew also there was a lot of history behind it. There was another group called, you know, the uh, sur uh, Surf, uh, uh, Black Corley, Surfing Association, Surfing Association, Black Surfers Association. Um, I knew of all these stories. I knew of, you know, what happened to African Americans during the Jim Crow, row, J Jim Crow era. And, and specifically to the population that was actually living on the beach, close to the beach, I had properties and I've lost it to, you know, eminent domain. So all this was in my mind. So I started reading several books and one of them that was just published was Afro Surf, a book from a surf company in South Africa called Mamiwata. And one of the founders was Salema Masikela. And in that book, the first chapter, the introduction had a, a write-up from uh, Professor Kevin Dawson. And in his write-up, he wrote that surfing existed a thousand years ago from the coast of Senegal to Angola, of course. Just no one told us, you know? <laughs> that just blew my mind, you know? I mean, here's a coastline, we never think about it. You know, we've been there for centuries, you know, millions, I mean, you know, for years and years, and you never put in context, like there's kayaking, there's, you know, boats, there's all kinds of aquatic culture in the west, east, south, north of Africa. But the idea of surfing for him to put that context around the idea that the first written account of surfing was in Africa in 1640, and the coast of Ghana by, uh, a, a, you know, a some by, by a German traveler, uh, Michael Hemerson. And the first account in Hawaii, which, you know, we're not negating, you know, where surfing started, but the first account, you know, uh, in Hawaii was 1770 by Captain Cook. So that account and that his context of like, if surfing existed, if the first account was 1640, and a thousand years back, Africans were canoeing. Anytime you're canoeing, most likely you're catching waves with your body, with boards and so forth. So that history just needed to be contextualized in, in a documentary. So hence, Wade in the Water was born. And I had a great conversation with uh, Kevin Dawson and he you know, agreed to be in the documentary <clears throat> I talked to Allison Jefferson, who's a, an amazing historian about the context of what happened during the Jim Crow in Southern California in context to Southern California. And then I met Begin. The great thing about Begin was we met through Instagram by accident. I saw this brother, you know, who's like surfing, he's traveling to Australia, all these places. I'm like, 
holy cow, what a life, you know? I'm like, I wish I had done that when I was his age, right? But I reached out to him. I said, hey, man, Bayin, I think you're Ethiopian. Um, I see you surfing. Would you like to check out? I'm working on a project. And I was wondering if you're interested. And, you know, I, I really had no idea he would be, you know, in the role of an executive producer or, you know, he, he would do any of it. it just like reaching out to him, just connecting with another brother. And he reached out and said, yeah, I'm interested. And we met. I told him about the project. He's like, yeah, there's tons of new surf organizations out there, which I didn't know because it was like COVID. I was locked down, but he was very much connected to the youth that was starting newer organizations like, you know, SoFly Surf School, which he's part of. Call of the Water, um, you know, Ebony Beach Club with Greg yes, and so many <laughs> and so many others, you know, Jessa with her organization that's just, you know, focusing on, you know, female surfers. So it was him that really took me, introduced me to this organization. And, you know, at the end, Wade in the Water became a story of, you know, introducing you to the origin, the challenges, the pioneers, the spiritual aspect of being a surfer and really looking at the future of black surfing. Yeah, totally. That's and a Binyan, great before you, you before you start, Binyan, because yeah. I know he gave you the Ethiopia. I know you were born in Ethiopia, but I yes, don't want to start a clubhouse war. Um, you also are of Eth or Eritrean. So you might be, wow. you, know, you had access to to water maybe um, <laughs> that you know is is that why you know t t I mean give us your whole story I just want to yeah. throw that out there because I don't want someone saying and they don't give a read through it you know how it can get yeah sometimes. yeah no I, I really I really appreciate that Kellen because that actually that was gonna be my first point like my mom would really appreciate if I were, right now took a moment to say I was born in Ethiopia and we have love for all our Habesha people all our people but you know, at the end of the day, I'm Eritrean by blood. My family's Eritrean, and you know, nothing against anyone, but just wanted to make, put that out there. So appreciate you, Kellen, for doing the research and actually knowing that. That's awesome. But um, but yeah, so I, I well, maybe maybe you're right. Like Eritrea does border the water. Ethiopia doesn't quite do that at the moment. But Eritrea is a very new country, and you know, maybe 30 years ago, before that, Eritrea and Ethiopia were just one country. And so you know, by the time David was born, there was no Eritrea. There was no you know back back generations. Eritrea was just part of Ethiopia. But yeah, just to give a little bit more context, I I grew up in Canada. I grew up in Toronto. I moved there when I was two years old, even though I was born in Ethiopia. And I grew up there. Never even thought about the idea of surfing. Never crossed my mind. I think about it all the time. Like I don't even think I saw an image of a surfer consciously or thought about hey, you could ride a wave on a board. I never even thought about this idea until I came to California for an internship. And then, you know, I saw a lot more surfers. Um, one of the people I worked with surfed a lot. And so I was like, hey, that's really interesting. My roommate surfed. He took us out surfing and kind of fell in love with it, really caught the bug. And, you know, by within like a couple of weeks, I was going maybe four or five times a week, waking up at 4 a.m. and driving to Santa Cruz like an hour and coming back before work. And so I was really hooked. And then I met a lot more black surfers, met a lot more of the community members through uh, Black Dot Surfers, Kaita Johnson. I met him really early. He was a big part of my like community integration, I would say. And then, yeah, fast forward, I uh, moved to L.A. full time after I graduated. That was an internship I moved to Northern California for. Met David, um, got involved with a lot of organizations, I guess, before I really met David. And then, yeah, he asked me if I wanted to take part. I was like, I'm honored, but, you know, I just want to help out as much as I can. And then the the kind of to answer your question more more specifically, the the history of surfing in Africa, that was really shocking for me. Like when David kind of told that to me, I, I almost couldn't believe it. I, I was doing research for days of like, are you serious? Like people were surfing in Africa, like black people a thousand years ago. I just couldn't believe that concept. And I was just like, you know, people need to know about this. And that's why I was so excited to work on the project. It's such an interesting story. And then uh, as we developed the story, you know, we matched it with kind of the Jim Crow era. You know, there are a lot of interesting things like, you know, one of the first people that organized the black surfing organization, he sent a letter to one of the big surfer magazines and, you know, got kind of galvanized a crew of people. And that's a really cool story, right? And then well, there are all kinds of stories. There's, you know, the first black surfer, Nick Gabaldon, that paddled 12 miles from Santa Monica to Malibu to catch some waves and paddle back. Like, that's also a crazy story. And then there are all these amazing orgs, like David mentioned, you know, Softly Surf School, Ebony Beach Club, there's Color the Water, Intersection Surf, Paddle for Peace, all these amazing people just introducing, you know, this aquatic culture back to the youth that, you know, have no idea. People like me that couldn't fathom the idea of, of black people surfing, let alone in Africa a thousand years ago. And then as I started to do more research, I learned about things like 
you know, the western coast of Africa is is massive. It's one of the biggest coastlines in the world. And it, it you know, it doesn't have a lot of natural harbors. And so it gets constantly just bombarded by big waves, big swell by the Atlantic Ocean. And so, you know, that means just just naturally people are going to have to learn how to deal with that. Everyone lives on the coast. Humanity lived on the coast for all of early humanity, really, because it was necessary for life and travel and, you know, all kinds of things. And so it's just natural that people are going to learn about tides and, you know, when is the wave coming? What is the wavelength? When is the law? How can I get out? How can I come back in? When is it? Where's the channel? How do I, what is the dangerous spots? Where are the rocks? People are going to figure it out. And then kind of a very important thing that I learned is, you know, economically, there's also a huge driver to figure out these, these waves and this idea of, of, of the ocean and surfing. Because, you know, if you want to go to an offshore fishery or if you want to travel to another city like on the coast or, you know, you just you just want to travel just in a different place through the water, you're going to have to learn how to get through the waves. You're going to have to learn how to get back, not break your boat. Um, so people are going to have to learn. And then eventually people just kind of turned it into a recreational thing. And then maybe the last thing that I really figured out that was really shocking was, like David said, surfing in Africa, there were European accounts, you know, like Salema, he says, it's not us telling tall tales. You know, it's European people that didn't even know what they were seeing, but they were they were describing African mothers teaching their kids how to surf at a young age. And this was in 1640, like way, way, way in the past. And we discovered Hawaii in 1780. And, you know, we're not trying to say that we gave surfing to the Hawaiians, but, you know, there's a lot of evidence now to show that there was a lot of independent discovery of this sport of surfing, this practice of surfing. And so that was like really the, the most amazing fact that I learned because the, the conventional idea of surfing, surfing history is really, you know, it started in Hawaii and that was the only place it ever started. And then Duke Hanamoku, he brought it to California and then eventually it spread to Australia and the rest of the world. And that's largely true. But, you know, there, now there's a lot of evidence, a lot of historians like Kevin Dawson doing a lot of amazing work to discover the facts that, you know, Africa had a lot of accounts of surfing way back before any discovery of Hawaii. There was surfing in Peru. Um, I'm sure we'll come to find out there was surfing everywhere. There was coastline and waves and swell. And so, yeah, just to answer your question a little bit more about the African feast, um, that's those are the, the really cool facts that I learned. And there are a bunch more stories that you, you really have to watch the, the full feature to kind of figure out. We don't really have enough time to kind of take over the whole podcast with those. Well, 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 break. I mean, there may be um, and, and tell me, you know, surfers, a lot of people, especially if you don't live on the coast. I'm from California, so it's it's a little different. But, you know, some people in Texas might be like, oh, surfers, they like to get high. They're bums, <laughs> you know, beach bums. But for all I know, you might be an ex Apple and Tesla worker who went to, you know, <laughs> Waterloo. So, I mean, give us the this game. This guy does his research. So give us a game on like, you know, are the majority surfers full time trying to go pro um, and all they do is get high when they're not surfing or do they, you know, are they engineers um, and can create and break things to, you know, make it work for them? Give us the game. Yeah, well, for, first of all, I'm shocked. This, 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 the research on the on the episode is really amazing. I'm, I didn't expect that. But um, but yeah, so I would say just a little bit of background about myself. Well, another thing I learned about when meeting all these people in the, in the community is it's, it's really diverse. It's, it's not monolithic at all. It's not, you can't really compare. And I think it's more diverse. I think the BIPOC surf community is more diverse than the general surf community because people have to face such challenges to get to that community. And it's not like everyone brings each other into that community. You know, I think in the traditional Southern California world of surfing, it's like, hey, I'm going surfing and then all my community is going surfing. And then I'm going to everyone kind of, you know, galvanizes around the central kind of culture of surfing. Right. But I think in the black community, it's much more individualistic, like everyone kind of finds surfing on their own. And really, a lot of people just do it individually. Like David was surfing by himself as, as far as not with other people of color for, for most of his life. Right. Until he moved to California. Um, same with me. I, I was surfing by myself most days. And, you know, it's really hard to find a lot of other people of color to surf with. And so maybe you get kind of sucked into the, the basic kind of main surf culture. But me personally, my background, like you said, is I'm an engineer. I don't have any production experience. I have no idea what I'm doing, really. I'm just taking David's lead and learning day by day. And so, yeah, I, I interned in Northern, in Northern California for Tesla for four months. And then I worked uh, on the iPhone team at Apple for another year long internship. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of once once I discovered surfing, I didn't I wasn't really interested in Northern California anymore because it doesn't have as much coastline access. And I really wanted to move to L.A. because that's where a lot of the BIPOC community was, a lot of coastline. 
And yeah, now I work for Beats by Dre. I do headphone design. I design like in-ear headphones, like one of these that I'm wearing right now. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of a little bit about myself. But I've met people, all kinds of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, you know, lawyers. Um, David is a creative director. He's a very successful creative director. He works on, you know, Hyundai Genesis kind of spots, commercials. And he's actually designed like Super Bowl commercials that have done really well, won awards. People wouldn't really think that. You know, Kai well, he went, to, he went to Kellogg. So, I mean, he also helped launch the Oakley, you know, website. So David is it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. David has done a lot and the best is yet to come. So, you know, you guys bother David when you're looking for venture capital funding. I, I promise you, he <laughs> might have some coins. <laughs> yeah, no, he has a story. He has a story kind of fast and really cool experience. But yeah, like a couple other notable people that I've kind of met to just explain a little bit more about the diversity that you, you asked about. Um, I think Kaita Johnson is another great example. He's a program manager, very successful. Um, I, I think all kinds of people, you know, people studying like speech therapy. I'm trying to think about some of the more off the wall kind of people. I, I know a lot of doctors that surf, um, you know, you know, all kinds of people like uh, across the spectrum. I would say if you're a surfer, though, maybe in general, you're more you're more resilient. Like David said, you've learned a lot of lessons. You have a lot of patience. You, you know, you've been tossed around. You come back. Um, you, I would say you're a pretty competent person. You're pretty disciplined in general because you got to wake up, you got to go hop in the cold water. Um, so, I mean, there's some general things you can you can say about surfers, but I don't think being lazy and weed smokers and this and that is really something that you can say across the board. I can tell you none of those things apply for David, that's for sure. Definitely, definitely. David, tell us with this film, you know, um, and, and I ask all my my guests this, and and both of you, please, you know, um, answer um, individually. What's the the community give back, you know, for for this 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 project that you're doing or that you plan? Maybe there's a ripple effect that you want to be able to, you know, open people's eyes because you know I know this is a this is a lifetime project and it, it, it doesn't, it seems to be very selfless where you're just wanting to, you know, share the history in a time where, you know, we really need it because we got people twerking and doing all type of things, shooting yeah. each other and, you know, and, and, yeah. and nothing wrong if you guys are, are, you know, enjoying your youth, enjoy it. But it just seems like we're in the back of that book right now. <laughs> And you're you're putting so a highlight on the past. So give us the game on your community give back for this film or just in life in general. Yeah. So the the give back, maybe there there are two give backs from this project. So one is really the objective from the beginning for me, and you know, as Begin came on board. I made it clear this was whatever we do is really to inspire the next generation of black surfers. So like giving, you know, the historical context of what it is to be a black person and connected to the ocean and the sport of surfing, which is unique now that we know that it existed a thousand years ago in Africa. And then, you know, by inspiring you is to, get you to learn how to surf, learn how to swim if you have to, and then learn how to uh, learn how to surf. And in context of weight in the water, you have all these organizations. If you live in Southern California, there are organizations in the East Coast as well, Hawaii, Africa, and the Caribbeans that you can join. A lot of them nonprofits that are willing and, um, and, and establishing, you know, uh, lessons from simple, like, you know, understanding waves, catching a wave, riding a wave, and then getting you to the competitive level if you want to. So that's really the give. The first give is inspire you, prepare you, kind of get you to know these organizations and find the organizations that can teach you how to surf, right? So that's the most important part. The second part, I think, is it's really the, to help dismantle the idea, the stereotype that Black people don't swim, Black people don't surf. You know, as surfers, we hear it all the time. You know, it's such a cliche, like Black people don't surf. You hear every surfer has heard that. And it's such a, a, a you know, a cliche that um, that need, that needs to be kind of forgotten. And once you hear the stories from Kevin Dawson and Allison and these individual surfers that are in this documentary, hopefully, you know, you'll understand there's a lot more to being a surfer than trying to emulate, you know, another culture. It is 
these these individuals have discovered something that's innate in them, um, even though they may not had the context that Kevin Dawson has given us now, um, it was in them to want to connect and to understand this thing called surfing. So those are really the two gifts from this uh, documentary. Yeah, Kellen, um, I think it's a good question. And I think from my perspective, I would I would highlight some, some I try to highlight different things than David. And so one thing I would say, actually, there's actually a more financial give uh, and that's more related to the artwork. And so actually 20% of the proceeds from the artwork will go to the five nonprofit organizations featured in the documentary. And so that's actually like a cold, hard, you know, financial kind of give back. And, you know, if people are interested in kind of supporting that way, that, that would be a great way to support the project but also the community. Um, and then secondly, me personally, I moved from Canada to LA. I didn't really know anyone. I knew I had one cousin in Hollywood. She didn't really surf. I didn't know, I didn't really know anyone when I moved to LA. And so through the black surfing community, through the BIPOC surfing community and through the surfing community at large, I really met all the people I, I kind of call my close friends now. And now I'm very lucky to have, you know, a very kind of thriving social life. And I, I, I can text people all the time to go surfing or hang out. And I'm really thankful for that. And I've really connected with some amazing people like David, you know, that's the only way I'm a part of this project, you know, softly surf school. We, we started a surf school with my friend Saw. Um, Paddle for Peace. We have a nonprofit in um, San Diego, La Jolla. We throw this big kind of Juneteenth event. Um, just amazing people I've met through the community, amazing person after amazing person. And I, I understand the value of that. That's been very valuable for me, you know, to, you know, really set down my roots, get situated. Um, both, both my roommates I've met through surfing, they surf every day, been extremely valuable for me. And so I, my, my main mission is really to pass that forward. And so I've already, before I met David, I've already been kind of trying to do that through these organizations like Safi, Safi Surf School, Paddle for Peace, um, mostly, mainly those two, but I, I try to be involved with as many organizations as possible. I'm very active on the Black Dot Surfers kind of page and Discord. And so this documentary really, I think one of the biggest value kind of offerings that I think will, will come, to, come to light is really the connection that people will make to the community. And who knows what that will lead to, you know, you, you can never, I think I really believe in the power of human connection and the power of one individual person, because people have really made a huge difference in my life, changed my life, just one person has made a huge, huge impact. And so I think I, I want to just really pass that forward and open up that opportunity to other people to, to connect with this amazing community and just find community in wherever you are. And especially if you live in Southern California, there, there are a bunch of resources for you. And so I think that from my point of view is, is really uh, the, the biggest kind of value give back that I can relate to personally. No, I, I love it. And I love it. And, you know, the, the movie, you guys, um, there's going to be a premiere in Los Angeles because, David, when you had mentioned, you know, Mami Wata, some folks are saying, no, no, I would never go to that. I can hear my my, my, my family um, who, you know, the, the African side, I can hear them say, no, that's a spirit. That's a mermaid. No, that's, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, they don't want to touch anything. But you guys, it's 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 bigger than that. It's just you know it, it's a website as as well. When he's talking about Afro Surf, but tell them about the um the premiere where they can see it, and then if in case they miss it and catch it later, where can they purchase um or watch it on you know the Amazon Prime, Netflix if you choose to you know um do business with Netflix, or if they're still in business by the time you hear this. But yeah, give us the game. <laughs> Do you know something we don't know? Uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't. I'm gonna leave that one alone. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So, in terms of premiere, so the beginning, of course, you know, we began actually by uh, sharing a sneak peek, an 18 minute version of it. Prior to, um, we went around and showed it through the coast of west coast of southern california and then eventually made it to brooklyn through partnership with patagonia currently we finished the full feature documentary which is 60 minutes long and that's going to premiere in the u.s at the santa barbara international film festival on february 11th and 12th so we would have the uh event there and a q a session for both days so we're grateful for santa barbara international film festival for accepting us, that'll be the premiere. And then from there, we're gonna end up at the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles on the 18th, that's a Saturday. Um, following that, we will be back with our initial partners, Patagonia and Surfrider LA on the 22nd in Santa Monica. 
uh, six o'clock, we're going to have a premiere and also a, a Q and A session. And then following that, we go down to uh, San Diego State University with uh, Dr. Gamble, who invited us there. He's an amazing surfer and a professor. Runs the Black um, Black Resource Center, and they are one of our sponsors. So we're going to have a screening there. So in terms of um, you know, East Coast, the middle of the country and Canada, we're working on that. We've submitted the film into different festivals. So the best thing to do is really visit wadeinthewaterproject.com where you will see the latest update of where we're going to be premiering it or screening it. Um, and also you can follow my Instagram page, which is dedicated for Wade in the Water. It's called David Mesfin Art. Um, and in there, we constantly update, you know, information about either organizations, events that we, we know of, and specifically, you know, to people that are part of this project and the community that Megan talked about. So yeah, um, in terms of Scream, you know, uh, you know having it online, you know, it, it, it really depends on um, a distributor. So the, the objective of film screening also is to find a distributor. So we don't have a distributor. Once we find a distributor, we will definitely announce that and allow you know the world to see it. So if we we're trying to inspire the next generation of black surfers anywhere in the world, we will you know we need to find a distributor that can share this you know documentary really worldwide. So that's the objective. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah. So Kellen, just quickly, you mentioned um, the Habesha Beer Company. If they could call you back, if you're a distributor, if you could please call us the first time, that would be that would be great. But um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to just say a quick thank you to our partners and um, just list them out really quickly, if you don't mind. Um, so we have we have uh, Patagonia, which has been super helpful. Uh, we've screened at a lot of their kind of locations and um, we are actually screening February 22nd at Santa Monica, the, the Patagonia store in partnership with uh, Surf Rider LA, which is another kind of um, partner of ours. And then Meta LA, we, we kind of did a great screening there. The, the World Surf League, WSL which is really amazing. We, uh, we have a partnership with them. They've sponsored the project, which we're very thankful for. Um, Heal the Bay Foundation, they're a great foundation doing things in LA in the Southern California area. Perspective Space is a great gallery in uh, North County, San Diego, which we had a very successful kind of screening event there as well. Um, I think Holly J. Mitchell and uh, the Los Angeles County, she's the Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Supervisor of the second district. She's been very helpful and kind of a friend to the project as well. Um, Surf Rider Foundation Eastern Long Island. We had a great screening out there. Um, although we weren't able to attend personally, it was, it was, uh, we heard it went really well. Mami Wata, obviously, they, they've supported us greatly throughout the whole process. And we launched our first kind of sneak peek event there. So we want to say thank you to um, Salema and Nick and Piet and everyone over there. And then Traveler Surf Club. Um, we had a great screening with them up in um, Santa Cruz. And so we want to say thank you to them. Awesome. Yeah, you gotta gotta thank those everybody, you know, it takes a team to make the dream come true. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Santa Barbara, man, being from Northern Cali. Yeah, I, 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 I know Santa Barbara quite, quite well, at least back in the day. Um, I'm sure things have changed, but it's 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 a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let let the people know for both of you for everything that you do you know, the best place if they want more information. And I will put links in the description, but I want to make sure it's links you guys want them to go to because they they may have gone to your Twitter and you say, man, I haven't used Twitter <laughs> since, you know, since, you know, totally. um, the, the genius has bought it. <laughs> totally. David, do you want to start? <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, for Wade in the Water, it's waitinthewaterproject.com. And then um, if you want to reach out through IG, it's David Mesfin Art. And then in terms of email, if you want to contact me directly, it's David, Mes David at davidmesfin.com. So those are the three ways to reach out to me. Yeah, my contacts are, are just on Instagram mostly. That's the main platform I use. I don't use Twitter really or, or any other kind of platform a lot. Um, just Bayon underscore A. You can find me on, on Instagram. Uh, you can find me through David's page as well or or just through the, the website. You can also join a mailing list on the website to, to keep up to date. We send out kind of newsletters and that's another great way to kind of keep up to date with the project. But um, but yeah, pretty simple. You can find my email through my Instagram page as well. Again, Bayon underscore A. 
And yeah, just one final thank you to everyone that's been kind of part of the project, uh, from Michael Warner to Zahil McDonald and Tafari. Um, David, do you know Tafari's last name? Uh, Tafari Seifu. Seifu, yes, correct, correct. We've had a lot of amazing should know. <laughs> I should, I should. That's our editor, yeah. amazing yeah, editor. Yeah. He's um, actually East African as well. Yeah, so he's Ethiopian too. I mean, it's like the Ethiopian connection on this project. So, the, you know, little story about uh, Tafari, just the same way as Bayan. I found Bayan on Instagram. I found Tafari on LinkedIn. I just need to find someone on Twitter now for distribution <laughs> that thing. So That's LinkedIn, I was just like, you know, posting. I think he liked one of the posts and and I saw like, he's an editor. I'm like, hey, do you, <laughs> you know, wrote him a letter about the project. He's like, yeah, let's chat. We chat it. And he's like, I love it. I want to work on this project. Let's do it. I said, all right. So send him files. He did the first edit just ever since we ended up, you know, working on this. He became the editor. And then we had another guy, Mike Warner, who came on board through his wife, who helped us when Tafari ended up going on on a bigger project. They stepped in, helped us edit this. So it's been like a gradual of like one team editing and then another team looking at it from a different perspective. And then finally going back to Tafari to finish it. So yeah. it's been great. Yeah. And just quickly, so I don't miss anyone, Byron was also a great editor that worked with Michael on the project. Yes. Um, the Den, the Den did a lot of great kind of post-processing work for us. Uh, we are Royale. We are Royale just actually made the, the intro sequence. Um, California Music, and then David. I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone else. There's San Diego State University we mentioned, but I don't know if I'm missing yep. anyone else. Mr. Gamble. So yeah, I mean these were you know you have the organizations that helped us, but then again you have companies. What Bayin is talking about. The Den is a post-production house. They did the color and finishing. California Music did the original music. We met them at Patagonia store. You know, we were there screening our, our sneak peek. They watched it like, hey, this is a great story, great edit, but the music sucks. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> all right, then <laughs> let's work on music together. So they came on board and, you know, really crafted this amazing music with a friend of theirs that came from, from Germany, and then they ended up, you know, doing a poetic piece at the end with, uh, you know, Academy Award winning uh, uh, a poet, which, you know, the documentary opens with poetry and ends with poetry. Um, and then, yeah, well, We Are Royale is a group that does, you know, motion animation. I met them years ago, I did projects with them for, you know, Hyundai. And I reached out to the owner and told him about the project. He's like, we got you, man. So they ended up doing the opening title, which ended up being beautiful. I so Company a lot Three? Of amazing Company people. Three as well, David? No, Company Three, actually, with Dave Hussey, I ended up, you know, um, working with uh, The Den. But yeah, okay. Dave was we very appreciate. supportive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we, we sorry, Kellen. We just want to make sure we don't miss anyone. And we, we yeah, no. Run in, man. <laughs> yeah, it takes a village. You can see it takes a, so many people. I just want to say thank you to everyone that we might have missed. It just takes so so many people have touched this project and Indeed. kind of put their blessing. And, and I think that's the only reason we're here talking to you today. It's the only reason we're at Santa Barbara. And we hope that's the only reason we can kind of make this project succeed. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. I can't say that enough. No, that that is that is great. And you know, usually I would tell a film, you know, director and executive producers, I say, hey, you guys gonna check out the NATPE because mm -hmm. of the financial issues with NATPE. And I know they're gonna still do something in Hungary. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> but we'll see. I would at least NATPE.com and give you guys credit for all that, you know, you have taught me. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great organization, but COVID, you know, did what it did and, and hopefully it will come back. But um, Urban Home Entertainment, they said they're looking for distribution. You guys, Mr. Dungy, Dungy family. Yes, sir. Out there in Atlanta, you guys have been, you know, a guest and you guys are definitely friends and family of the show. So when you get this, Mr. Dungy, Dungy, that's why you got it. Um, you know, we'll talk more about that, you guys, off air. But I want you right now to share the game, you guys, that you've been blessed with. It will change someone's life. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank thank you. you one so question much. for you, Kellen. One question. Just one, one comment. If, if we do get that distribution, we'll, we'll put you on as an executive producer for sure. We got you. But um, I wanted to ask you, which which screening are you coming to? What, that's, that's the my last question. 
You know, I have to look at the calendar. I just okay. got home off of a two month. My kid said, daddy, what do you mean? Usually we travel together. And I've been going from God Kenya <laughs> to the African summit to, you know, <laughs> Vegas to CES and then God New dear. Orleans and all these. And they're like, okay, we're, so it depends. It's kid friendly. I, I know it by is. watching yeah, the movie. Yeah. So you guys, but um, we can definitely look into that. And I always tell people, since you put me on the spot, I say it depends where the plane ticket's coming from a, a lot of times. <laughs> that's, we got to talk. If we get the distribution, we got to talk. We got to yeah. talk. Yeah, you know, you send the ticket. Um, I'm right here in South Florida, um, whether it's commercial or the Aero Club, which is just down the street from me. If you have, you know, the private plane at the Aero Club, you, yeah, gotcha. come pick gotcha. me up. It's all good. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> hey, uh, we're we'll, we'll working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it offline. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm like Kenneth Copeland, man. Sometimes I don't want to fly with all the demons, you know, but that's, <laughs> that's you guys share the okay. game. The best conversations are always offline. Peace, y'all. Hi, everyone. Have you ever been curious about visiting Africa? Which African country were you interested in? Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, South Africa, Ethiopia? Which country are you interested in? My good friend, Kellen Cash Coleman came up with a course called My First Trip to Africa that'll guide you through this process. It's only $20, and in this course, you'll learn about passports, visas, vaccinations that you need before you go there, as well as a budget, uh, how much the trip is gonna cost. He also talks about what you should pack, uh, what you should take with you, how you should travel on a budget. Did you know that 100 US dollars is worth 1,000 South African Rand and over 10,000 Kenyan shillings? So imagine what you can do with $100 back home. I say back home because I'm from Sudan, I'm African, I already know how it's like. I know that, you know, when you convert Canadian and American money, it goes a long way when you're traveling across Africa. So if you're curious, um, if, if Africa is a place that you've always wanted to go, always wanted to move there, Kellen Cash is the person to ask. Check out the course, there's a little preview you can listen to. Um, before you actually purchase it. If you're interested in this course, visit www.diversifiedgame.com. Don't miss out.